On July the 17th, 1918, Russia's Tsar Nicholas II, his wife and five children, are reported to have been executed. But their bodies could not be found. Then, in 1991, a grave is uncovered. Two of the children are missing. All the time there was this confusion, the myth and the possibility of some or all or any of them surviving. In 2007, a second burial site is unearthed. But can its contents finally reveal the true story of what happened to the lost royal children? Investigating unpublished reports of attempts to rescue the Tsar's family, and with access to leading forensic scientists, striving to extract evidence from severely degraded bones. We open the mystery files on the Romanovs. beginning of the 20th century. The Romanov family are at the heart of Russian life. Tsar Nicholas II has been emperor since 1894. Helen Rappaport is a historian and author specializing in Russian history. She has studied in depth the private lives of the Romanovs. For the Russian people at large, for the peasantry, Nicholas was a divine being, and they did revere him. They did bow down and, and cross themselves whenever he passed. His Royal Highness, Prince Michael of Kent, is a distant relative of the Russian Tsar through the British royal family. He was a godlike figure to them. So that reverence was very, very powerful. With his German-born wife, the Tsarina Alexandra, they are the perfect royal couple. What really nailed the popularity of the Romanov family was undoubtedly those five extraordinarily beautiful children. <laughs> Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia are the four adored daughters. The youngest child is their son and heir to the throne, Alexei. The family's official residence is here, in the Winter Palace, St. Petersburg. Historian Charlotte Zipvat has written extensively about the lives of the Romanovs. The Winter Palace is the most extraordinary setting to live in and to grow up in. You have acres of gold leaf and miles of marble around you. But in stark contrast, by 1914, Russia is in turmoil. Germany declares war. And within a year, approximately one and a half million Russians are killed or wounded. Andrew Cook is a historian specializing in early 20th century British intelligence. Every failing of the Russian war machine is reflected back on the Russian government, which is actually Nicholas. He is now personally seen as being responsible. As the conflict takes its toll, there is starvation in the cities. Despite reports of growing unrest, the Romanovs are shielded from the discontent brewing outside the charmed life of their palace. In February 1917, after three years of war, the Romanovs face mounting hostility. Political agitators seize their chance and trigger the Russian Revolution. It was a combination of real, literal hunger for food, but also a desperate, desperate, ongoing desire for democratic freedom. Nicholas is forced to step down from the throne. In a way, it comes as a great relief to him. He was never really a man who relished being a ruler. The Romanovs retreat here, to the Alexander Palace, 27 kilometers south of St. Petersburg. As the provisional government takes control of a country in chaos, the family are placed under house arrest for their own protection. There was extreme Republican feeling out on the streets, and the mob, if given half a chance, would have stormed the palace and would have strung Nicholas and Alexandra up. In October 1917, the Bolshevik party, led by Vladimir Lenin, seized power. The Bolsheviks are a revolutionary, hardline group who are, are 
pathologically and passionately against the aristocracy and Nicholas in particular. The Tsar and his family are taken to the Bolshevik stronghold of Ekaterinburg in the Urals, over 1,700 kilometers from their home. Nicholas said, that's about the last place on earth I would want to go to. He said, I know people there are very against me. This is the heavily guarded house where the family are held as prisoners, under the control of a hardline commandant, Yakov Yurovsky. Yurovsky was a dedicated revolutionary. His basic role, apart from overseeing the guards at the house, was to prepare for the need to kill the family. He had a duty to the revolution, and he was determined to fulfill it at any price. He could sit down and quite happily engage in conversation when he knew full well within a couple of days he was going to go and murder the family. In a testimony given by Yurovsky after the revolution, he states that around 2 a.m. July the 17th, 1918, guards inform the Romanovs they are being moved to the cellar. Yurovsky's men were gathered in a room nearby, priming and checking their weapons. Yurovsky orders the family together for a group photograph, just like they have done countless times before. The girls huddle with their mother. The Tsar stands by his son. <laughs> their captors line up in front of them. Yurovsky read out a very summary and brief statement that it has been decided that Nicholas must be executed. The family are in disbelief. <laughs> Nicholas was the lucky one. He died instantly. But most of the others did not. They suffered terribly. There was screaming and smoke and people couldn't see what they were doing. One by one, each of the children are gunned down at point-blank range. In total, 103 shots are fired. This photograph of the cellar room is taken at the scene of the crime. Now the Bolsheviks need to ensure the bodies are not recovered and glorified by Tsarist sympathizers as martyrs. Yurovsky's written accounts describe the terrible events that follow. To dispose of the remains and leave no trace, the blooded corpses are taken to remote woods. Peter Sarandinaki is part of an international team of investigators searching for the burial sites. Yurovsky gave the order to take the bodies out of the truck and decided right then and there to bury the bodies on a spot. But it is nearly dawn. Yurovsky and his men are afraid they will be spotted. Unceremoniously, the Romanovs are thrown into a pit covered with acid and set alight. They had this idea that they were going to incinerate the corpses initially out in the forest. Now, had they done their homework? Had they checked how long it actually takes to burn one body in the open air? Depending on the heat, Fire needs around seven hours to consume tissue and fat, leaving the skeleton coated only in a greasy residue of burnt flesh. It is now that a crucial decision is made, that for the next seven decades keeps alive the hope that two of the children might have survived. According to the Yurovsky report, they took the two smaller sets of remains nearby and started burning those remains. They separated them off from the other pile of bodies. For 80 years, the two sites where the Romanovs are supposed to be buried are lost. In 1991, a grave is uncovered in the remote forest near Ekaterinburg. Scientists analyze the excavated bone fragments with DNA. Dr. Michael Koble is a forensic scientist at the Armed Forces Laboratory in Washington, DC. Our laboratory was involved with the first round of DNA testing. 
The findings were quite clear. Of those remains, there was uh, a consistent family association between the skeleton believed to be Nicholas, the skeleton believed to be Alexandra, and three of their daughters. This is the Paul and Peter Fortress, St. Petersburg. In 1998, seven years after their bones are exhumed, Tsar Nicholas II and four members of his family are interred here. The Romanovs are canonized as saints. Prince Michael of Kent was present at the ceremony. It was a very poignant moment, because that's where the Tsars had always been buried since uh, Peter the Great created the city. A pair of tombs remain unoccupied. For Alexei, the young prince and heir to the throne, and one of the daughters, either Maria or Anastasia. The big mystery was, of course, what happened to the two missing children. It was a completely closed story. There was no question of a mother being found. Determined to uncover the truth, year after year, Peter Sarandinaki and his team systematically searched the area around the Tsar's grave, looking for a second burial site. It's a five-acre open meadow of grass surrounded by a forest on three sides. And, and on the eastern side is all swamp. We scraped off the top uh, roughly 10 centimeters of the soil and to try to level the ground so that the ground penetrating radar would, would be able to go over it and be able to find anomalies. And we did not find anything. With no sign of two buried bodies, rumors emerge that Yurovsky's account of the assassination might be exaggerated and that perhaps the missing children had escaped or been rescued after all. A plan took shape in the spring of 1917, one year before they are shot, while the family are being held in the Alexander Palace. There are enormous uncertainties surrounding what will happen and where they will go. The family are encouraged to leave the country. Nicholas turns to his close friend and relative, King George V. Well, they were first cousins, um, and they were, they, they were in very affable terms together. They were very close. People often remarked how the two men bore a striking resemblance to each other. Nicholas requests to George that his family take refuge in England. He was very concerned about what was happening. It is thought that arrangements were made for a British ship to be waiting for the Romanov family at the port of Murmansk, 1,000 kilometers north of St. Petersburg. From there, they would sail to safety in the UK. George's initial instinct, like anybody's, was to offer refuge to his cousin. But there was a problem, and the problem was that Alexandra was a German, and there was incredible anti-German feeling in Britain at the time. Faced with the prospect of political unrest at home in the UK, King George has no choice and is pressed to withdraw the invitation. It's undeniably the case that he's pulled up the drawbridge and that Nicholas and, and his family are now stranded in a very hostile environment. Proposals for the family to be officially exiled to the UK are shelved. When civil war erupts, the family are forced to leave St. Petersburg and are taken to Ekaterinburg. It seems their fate is sealed. The mansion house where the family are held is ominously renamed by the new government the House of Special Purpose. Heavily guarded, it becomes their prison. Nicholas writes in his diary, We have absolutely no news from outside. And it was a very despairing moment where you could tell, I think, that he'd given up all hope of rescue. But unknown to the Tsar, Despite King George's official refusal to give the Romanovs asylum, rescuing them is still being considered in London. Behind closed doors, the British hatch a secret plot to free the family from their prison. Hidden for 90 years, documents now disclose how reconnaissance is assigned to one of their most senior spies in Russia. Stephen Alley is essentially a specialist he was born in Russia, he spoke fluent Russian, and could dissolve into everyday Russian life. This is Ali's notebook. Kept by his family over the generations, it contains entries from his trip to Ekaterinburg. 
his unique collection of documents really does shine a very bright light on what he was doing at that time. Intelligence work of that kind is exceptionally risky. Um, if he had have been uncovered and arrested, you know, almost certainly he would have faced uh, a firing squad. Ali's log also has a rough sketch of the location of the house where the Romanovs are being held. Together with Russian files, it is now possible to build up an accurate picture of their prison. The family are kept in a corner on the first floor in four rooms. Uh, we also know that uh, on the same floor was a guard room. There are also guards at the top of the stairs, on the staircase itself. The family's quarters were surrounded by guards. We actually see lists naming uh, the personnel and the individuals who were there. We can see their shifts. We can see how many there were. There were machine gun nests trained on the house from the bell tower of the church. There were machine gun placements in the garden, in the basement. There is no way that family could have been got out of there without a bloodbath. Ali would have reported back that this was uh, a suicide mission, that this really wasn't uh, a situation where he could conceive of a realistic possibility of success. Ali's plan to rescue the Romanovs is never attempted. But when the five bodies are identified in 1991, two of the children are still unaccounted for. Speculation that they somehow escaped persists. The mystery of their disappearance remains unsolved. All the time there was this confusion, the myth and the possibility of some or all or any of them surviving. Then in June 2007, a second burial site is found, just 60 meters from the first grave. Although these bones had been chopped up and burned, only 44 small pieces of bone still gave clues. We had two people. We had a boy, aged 12 to 15, and we had a girl from 17 to 19. Who the shattered remains belong to can only be found from their DNA. But this time, scientists are faced with an almost insurmountable challenge. Evgeny Rogev is a leader in the field of genetic identification. He is invited by Russian officials to try and extract DNA from the newly discovered cache. When we look at the fragments, uh, we were very skeptical. That is a challenge to the geneticists, how to work with very degraded DNA. Most of the fragments were very small. In fact, too small for DNA testing. There were probably only about 10 or so bone fragments that were large enough for DNA testing. DNA is a genetic fingerprint unique to each of us, carrying traits handed down from generation to generation. The first thing we wanted to do was to look at the mitochondrial DNA. Now, the mitochondria are passed only through the maternal line. So mothers give their mitochondria type to their children. When the first grave was discovered in the 1990s, tests identified that DNA was shared between Zarina Alexandra and three daughters, Olga, Tatiana, and one of the youngest daughters, either Maria or Anastasia. If the two newly discovered bodies are related, they will share the same DNA. The scientists must painstakingly search the bones for any surviving cells. We scrape away the outer surface of the bone and we crush it up into a powder. And then we use an extraction buffer that then completely dissolves the bone and liberates the DNA. We were quite surprised ourselves that we indeed uh, were able to determine the complete mitochondrial DNA sequences and what we found was that the leg bone believed to be from a female and the leg bone believed to be from a male both have the same mitochondrial DNA sequence as Alexandra. But the work is still far from over. To reach a complete and incontrovertible conclusion, investigators must make a match between these children and their father. For that, a direct comparison is required, but 
There is only one sample of Tsar Nicholas's DNA from when he was alive that scientists know of. And they also know it was lost decades ago. On May 1891, uh, during his travel to Osaka in Japan, Nicholas Romanov, then uh, heir to the throne, was attacked. Nicholas was bleeding all over his shirt. He was uh, holding the side of his head with his hand uh, to stop the bleeding. The shirt of the Nicholas II with traces of the blood uh, was stored in a uh, state hermitage museum in St. Petersburg. Once home to the Romanov family, it now houses a collection of over three million artifacts. The museum said, we can't find it. We, we have no idea where it is. So they do an inventory, and they just so happen to come upon this shirt. It is the crucial piece of evidence. But the shirt is over 100 years old, and DNA in blood degrades over time. Professor Rogayev is the first to examine the fabric. I was very skeptical that it is possible at all to extract the DNA. He was afraid chemical preservation, heat or humidity could have destroyed the DNA. We were very surprised we extracted uh, DNA of great quality. Stored in a drawer wrapped in paper, Nicholas's genetic imprint survived to tell its story. And when we compared these genetic profiles from the blood stains and from the bone specimens, we found perfect match. It was four trillion times more likely that these two children are children of Nicholas and Alexandra than if they were just two random people in the population. Everybody in the room started crying. It was a very emotional time because now we have definitive proof that these are the missing children and that this you know, nearly 90-year-old uh, mystery is now solved. None of us, whether we're Romanovs or anybody else, I don't think, has any, any doubt because the DNA tests are definitive. In February 2009, after two years of forensic investigations, scientists confirmed that the remains of the two missing Romanov children have been identified. Proof of their execution dispels the last hope that any of them survive. Only now can the reality of their cruel end be fully understood. I think that it's one of the most shocking things that has happened, certainly, in the last hundred years. To them, it was political. To us, it was not. To us, just murder. A brutal, bloody murder. The fates conspired against the Romanovs. Now, a century later, the last of Russia's ruling dynasty can finally be laid to rest. <laughs>